All right, uh, Sergeant Polite, the live is on. Please start your recording. Recording to the computer or set. Great. Okay, good evening. Welcome to the remote hearing of the New York City Advisory Commission on Property Tax Reform. Everyone, please turn on your video at this time. Silence all electronic devices. All written testimony can be submitted at nyc.gov slash property tax reform slash testimony. Closed captioning is available and can be accessed by clicking on the live transcript icon on the bottom of your Zoom menu bar. Thank you. Chair, we're ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Good evening, I'm Mark Shaw. I'm the chair of the commission and a senior advisor at the CUNY Institute for State and Local Governance. Today's Zoom hearing is the last of five borough-based hearings on the preliminary report of the advisory commission. Hearings were previously held in the Bronx on June 14th, Queens June 9th, Brooklyn May 27th, and Staten Island on May 11th. For members of the public who are listening who would like to submit written testimony, please do so as soon as you can. Um, you may submit testimony at nyc.gov slash property tax reform slash testimony. 34 people have signed up to testify tonight and 37 Manhattan residents have submitted written testimony, some of whom are also presenting oral testimony. Before we begin with public testimony, I wanna say thank you to all the members of the public who submitted written testimony, as well as those here tonight who are taking time out of their schedules to testify on the Advisory Commission's preliminary report. We value what each of you has to say, so please know that even if we don't directly respond to your testimony today, we are listening and your testimony will be part of our deliberations. With 34 people registered to testify tonight, it's in the interest of time that we cannot respond individually. In January 2020, the Commission released 10 preliminary recommendations to reform the property tax system. Hearings were initially planned to begin in March 2020, but delayed to, due to COVID-19. We request that public testimony specifically respond to the Commission's 10 recommendations. I will now read the Commission's 10 rec recommendations. One, the Commission recommends moving co-ops, condominiums, and rental buildings with, with up to 10 units into a new residential class, along with one to three family homes. The property tax system will continue to consist of four classes of property, residential, large rentals, utilities, and commercial. Two, the commission recommends using a sales-based methodology to value all properties in the residential class. Three, the commission recommends assessing every property in the residential class at its full market value. Four, the commission recommends that annual market value changes in the new residential class be phased in over five years at a rate of 20% per year, and that assessed value growth caps should be eliminated. Five, the commission recommends creating a partial homestead exemption for primary resident owners with income below a certain threshold. The exemption would be available to all eligible property resident owners in the residential class and would replace the current co-op condo tax abatement. The commission, six, the commission recommends creating a circuit breaker within the property tax system to lower the property tax burden on low income primary resident owners based on the ratio of property tax paid to income. Seven, the commission recommends replacing the current class share system with a system that prioritizes predictable and transparent tax rates for property owners. The new system would freeze the relationship of tax rates among the tax classes for five year periods, after which time the city would conduct a mandated study to analyze if adjustments need to be made to maintain consistency in the share of taxes relative to the fair market value borne by each tax class. Eight, the commission recommends <clears throat> that current valuation methods should be maintained for properties not in the new residential class, that is rental buildings with more than 10 units, utilities and commercial. Nine, the commission recommends a gradual transition to the new system for current owners with an immediate transition into the new system whenever a property in the new residential class is sold. 10, the commission recommends instituting comprehensive reviews of the property tax system every 10 years. I'd like to now, <clears throat> excuse me, introduce to the public 
the other members of the commission. Um, we'll start as we always do in alphabetical order with Alan Capelli. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Alan Capelli. Uh, I am a member of the city planning commission and this body. I've also been in government for 40 years in senior management positions. I'm a single family homeowner in the city, a co-op owner. I have lived in this city my entire life. And I, along with my uh, exceptional colleagues here, uh, are looking forward to your testimony as we're trying to make this a fairer system for everybody who lives in the city. So thank you. We appreciate your testimony and let's get on with it. Thank you, Alan. Next up, we have Carol Clerican. Hi, good evening. I'm Carol O'Claricon. I'm a former uh, New York City Finance Commissioner and Budget Director. I am currently an adjunct professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. I am a resident <clears throat> and co-op owner in Manhattan uh, and have been since 1980. And uh, I want you to know I've read all the testimony that's been submitted and am looking forward very much to hearing what you have to say tonight. And I thank you for coming and I thank you for being interested and concerned. Thanks. Thank you, Carol. <clears throat> Next up, we have uh, Ken Knuckles. Are we had Ken Knuckles? <clears throat> Commissioner Knuckles, you're on mute. Uh, I'll start. My name is Ken Knuckles. I am vice chair of the New York City Planning Commission. I have served as a commissioner of general services in the uh, city of New York, as well as a uh, deputy borough president. I'm an attorney and I live in the borough of the Bronx in a two family home that I have owned since 1984. And I look forward to your testimony this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Next up, we have uh, James Parrott. Good evening. <clears throat> James Parrott, uh, Director of Economic and Fiscal Policies at the Center for New York City Affairs at the New School. Uh, I'm a single family homeowner in Brooklyn and have been for the past 25 years. Uh, I look forward to uh, hearing your testimony this evening. Thank you all for turning out um, and uh, participating in this undertaking. Thank you. Thank you, James. And last but not least, we have Elizabeth Velez. Good evening, all. My name is Elizabeth Velez. I'm a business owner in Manhattan. <coughs> I reside in the Bronx and am a renter. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution to New York City by coming out tonight and participating in this process. Thank you, Elizabeth. So in addition to our commission members, we also have with us the ex officio members representing the mayor's office and the city council. I'd like to now turn things over to Emra, our moderator for the hearing this evening. Uh, thank you, Chair Shaw. My name is Emra Adev and I work at the city, uh, New York City Council's Finance Division. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you recognize to speak, at which time you will be unmuted by the Zoom host. If you mute yourself after you have been unmuted, you will need to be unmuted again by the host. Please be aware that there could be a delay in muting and unmuting, so please be patient. I will be calling on panelists to testify one by one, so please listen for your name to be called. Commission members, you have the ability to unmute yourself during the hearing. So if you have a question for a panelist, you may unmute yourself at the appropriate time. But please remember to go back on mute once you have completed your question. We will now start with testimony from elected officials, followed by, followed by the public. Panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin your testimony before delivering your testimony you will have two minutes to present your testimony. With that, uh, I will first uh, call on Council Member Margaret Chin, followed by Katie Loeb on behalf of Council Member Carlina Rivera. Thank you, good evening. And thank you to the commission for allowing me to testify and all the commissioner for your hard work. Um, 
my concern is that as one of your recommendations stand that a uh, small rental with 10 units or less are gonna be grouped together with home ownership oriented property as one to three family home along with co-op and condo. And that leaves all the other rentals in a separate category. My concern is that the small and medium you know, size rental, let's say 16 unit, they're gonna be grouped with a larger group. Uh, so what is the difference? when you say 10 units or less. I mean, what about 11 unit? Why are they grouped with the, the larger buildings um, in the city? And in my district, especially in Chinatown, the Lower East Side, I have lots of buildings that are much smaller in the 20s and 30 units. And these are buildings that are owned by, you know, families for generation and it's also owned by what we call family association, like the Chins and the Wongs and the Lees. Uh, and those are our ancestors who save money to purchase the building. And these buildings offer a lot of affordable housing. There are a lot of rent controlled units and rent stabilized unit, but they are always burdened by, you know, the high property tax and the rent that they collect are not enough for their maintenance. And oftentimes it's the commercial unit on the ground floor that helps subsidize. So I just want the, the commission to really think about um, how we can help these small size rental and medium sized rental that are creating and preserving affordable housing in our city. So based on conversation that I've been having with our uh, council uh, committee on finance, I want to make the following recommendation uh, that would make the property tax system fairer and more transparent, uh, especially for building with rent regulated apartment. Uh, one is create a new class for smaller and older rent regulated property uh, that are more than the 10 unit that you have recommended. And look closely at how these units are being evaluated as well as their taxation level. And think about prov providing long-term uh, tax deferral program. So the tax increases are only collected if the property is sold to a new owner. Because oftentimes a lot of these legacy owners and family association, they don't want to sell their building. They want to keep it. And, but they are having a tough time, you know, with the increase in property tax. So I thank you for your time. And I really uh, look forward to continue working with you to make sure that we have a more fair and equitable tax fine. system. Thank you. Council member, could you put this in writing in some form so that it gets into the written testimony? Yes, we'll, Thank we'll, you. we'll send an official one. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Thank you, Council Member Chin. Uh, we'll now hear from Katie Loeb on behalf of Council Member Rivera. Time starts now. Hi, thank you. I'm Katie Loeb. I'm the budget director for Councilwoman Carlina Rivera, who represents District 2 on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. Um, I'm going to read prepared testimony, so you'll hear me say I or my, but it refers to uh, the Councilwoman's. So thank you for your work on these 10 recommendations, which show a dedication to reforming the tax system to be more equitable to residents and families of New York City. The first recommendation to move co-ops and condos from Class 2 properties to Class 1 properties represents a big step in fair and more transparent assessments, as these properties will no longer be assessed as revenue generating rentals, but as single family homes based on market sales. Whether a house in Staten Island or a co-op in Kipps Bay, these are homes for New Yorkers and they should be treated equally. However, in Manhattan, sky high condominium sales and continued luxury development threaten to distort the value of existing apartments and could potentially increase the tax bill for longtime homeowners many of whom are seniors on a fixed income or young families who can't afford to absorb these higher costs. While these new developments should be taxed at their proper values, we need to put measures in place to protect people from displacements or foreclosure. As a member of the Lean Sale Task Force, I understand what is at stake and that these reforms must be designed to protect New York homeowners. You have provided two recommendations, which I believe will help achieve this goal. The Homestead Exemption in Recommendation 5, and the circuit breaker in recommendation six, which caps property taxes at a certain percentage of income for low income New Yorkers. The homestead exemption should be broadly defined so as many people who actually live in New York can receive the benefit. And while this will go a long way to, to helping keep taxes affordable, uh, the circuit breaker will be necessary for a lot of people. Um, in my district, the most vulnerable to displacement are seniors who are retired and living on a fixed income or retirement savings. 
And while they might not traditionally qualify as low income, an increase in their expenses can be financially destabilizing. Uh, I propose considering earned income differently from retirement savings payouts as these are fixed and can't adjust to a market and also considering deducting certain oh, medical slide. expenses uh, from the circuit breaker calculations. Um, similarly, uh, consider evaluating a deduction for certain childcare costs to help stabilize families as well. Uh, thank you so much for your time and I can answer any questions or you can contact uh, me and you'll have my email address and contact. Thank you, Councilmember Rivera. Um, we will now hear from Mary Ann Rothman. And, and, sorry, and you will also put this in writing? And yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I submitted it just 20 minutes ago, so you'll okay. have it soon. Terrific. I knew I hadn't seen it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we will now hear from Mary Ann Rothman, followed by Anna Champany. Time starts now. Good evening. My name is Mary Ann Rothman. I'm the executive director of the Council of New York Cooperatives and Condominiums, representing hundreds of the housing co-ops and condos in all five boroughs of New York City and beyond. Since 1990, when we founded the Action Committee for Reasonable Real Estate Taxes, we've advocated for fair, equitable, and easily understood property taxes for all of New York City. Uh, our thanks to the Advisory Commission for the preliminary report and for this series of hearings where some very good ideas have come forward. Their hearings have also made it clear, however, that there's great misunderstanding of how property taxes work. That when assessments are higher, then lower rates will still adequately fill the city coffers and that market value assessments are not the death knell for affordable home ownership. We will be amending the testimony we've already submitted to make suggestions about possible education to allay fears of being taxed out of one's home or livelihood, and some other suggestions relating to the consideration of a tax credit for first responders and others who put their lives on the line to protect and serve New Yorkers improving ways that the star exemption is distributed, making adjustments to the thresholds for programs like J51 to coordinate with new assessment practices, and providing some form of tax credit for major energy conservation or carbon reduction expenditures. We look forward to your final recommendations and dare to hope that they will uh, include a two-class property tax system easy to understand and to implement that deals fairly and equitably with all New York City taxpayers through the use of a homestead exemption for anyone whose house, condo, or co-op is their primary residence, and with a wide range of circuit breakers attentive to owners' special needs, their economic status, their service to the country or to our city, their efforts to improve their physical plant, plus energy and carbon status of their building and social justice issues as well. Thank you very much for these many opportunities to express our views at these hearings. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Anna Champany, followed by Mark Willis. Time starts now. Uh, good evening, um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, I am Anna Champany, the Director of City Studies at the Citizens Budget Commission, a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank focused on uh, construct advocating for constructive change in the services and finances of New York City and New York State government. CBC and many New Yorkers have called for reform to the city's Byzantine and unfair property tax system for decades. Your thoughtful work will be a significant contribution on the long road to comprehensive reform. The preliminary report's recommendations focused in great part on reducing the inequities and tax burdens among residential properties and largely aligned with prior CBC testimony. We would like to recommend that the commission further address four areas in the final report. First, to develop a simple and transparent rate setting process that eliminates the function of class shares and distributes the levy based on clearly articulated policy rationales for the differential levels of taxation. 
The preliminary report's recommendations do not alter the relative burdens between the classes and in fact envision maintaining the effective tax rates over time, which misses the opportunity to address the high tax burdens for rental and commercial property in New York City and perpetuate current disparities. CBC has recommended that homeowners have the lowest effective tax rates, followed by rental properties and then commercial properties, but that the existing disparities be narrowed. Second, expand the scope to address disparities within the rental and commercial classes. While we agree with you that the net income capitalization is the appropriate method to value large rental and commercial property, improvements are needed. DOF should be conducting sales ratio studies, modifying their models to ensure consistency within the classes and providing greater transparency on how assessment guidelines and capitalization rates are set. Third, provide details on how the homestead exemption and circuit breaker should be structured. Um, while, CBC, while CBC endorses these approaches, we uh, cannot support them without greater details regarding eligibility structure and benefit levels. Uh, and fourth, clarify how the assessed values for the new residential class will be set. Um, we uh, support your work and look forward to continuing to participate in this important policy dialogue and are here if you have any additional questions. Thank you for your testimony. Um, we will now hear from Mark Willis, followed by Robert Fainer. Time starts now. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Um, my name is Mark Willis, Senior Policy Fellow at NYU uh, Furman Center, and I'm speaking on my own behalf. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to testify again. Uh, this time I'd like to highlight one particular point, what has been a key impediment in the past to the reform. Uh, we can talk as much as we want to about uh, the, the great ideas, and I think a lot of those have already been incorporated uh, in uh, the Commission's uh, suggestion, but uh, in the end, if we can't uh, pass reform in some form, uh, all of those good ideas uh, are not of uh, value. Uh, so um, what I want to focus on is uh, the AV caps, the assessment value caps, because they have contributed to growing inequities uh, for one to three uh, unit um, residential buildings, class one, and for small multifamily buildings, uh, part of uh, class two. Unwinding these in inequities will cause assessed values of properties which have been benefiting from the caps to increase relative to those of properties which have not been benefiting. Uh, caps. These higher relative assessed values can mean in turn higher tax bills and a lowering of property values, uh, an outcome that I, uh, has uh, traditionally uh, built a lot of opposition. So failing to unwind these uh, AV caps cannot be an option if the goal of reform is a fairer property tax system. In the remainder of my testimony, I want to lay out a couple options, uh, one of which uh, was not offered uh, available to the Commission, but it is to lower tax rates on the effective property types thereby mitigating the effects of increases in assessed values. All properties within each of the affected property types would benefit. And um, all of these property types have now uh, conveniently uh, been suggested by the commission to be put into the residential, uh, what's called a residential class. Obviously the and downside the is a required reduction in revenue. This is a problem that needs to be obviously considered. You can do a a narrow reduction, uh, uh, a more focused reduction, uh, such as uh, would be possible uh, with uh, the partial homestead exemption, where at least lower income homeowners uh, can uh, benefit from a, a reduction, uh, lower effective uh, tax rate. A completely different approach, which is not incompatible. Uh, I stress here, you talk about a five-year phase in, I think you should consider a much longer phase in. There is no rush to do this. Uh, many of what you, uh, your proposals were there in 1980. Uh, we're now many years later and still have made no progress. In fact, things have gotten much worse in terms of inequity. Uh, so I suggest that you uh, give serious consideration to a much longer phase in than the five years. Uh, and also, uh, it's very important to have the circuit breaker that, uh, that you have uh, uh, proposed. So um, I think the, the commission has the right goals, simpler, clearer, fairer. The challenge is to get there. Thank you. Mark, we have your written testimony and thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll now hear from Robert Feiner, 
followed by Michaela Grimm. Time starts now. Uh, good morning and thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, my name is Robert Feiner. I live on the Upper East Side in a co-op. I'm also on the board of directors. Uh, my building is a mid-sized co-op with 110 uh, units. And if this recommendation is enacted, what you will find is that most of my uh, residents, including myself, will not be able to afford to live in the city anymore. Uh, our co-op is basically a middle-class co-op. We have people that have uh, comprised of small families. Uh, we have retirees and we have people soon to be retirees. And if this is enacted, uh, I know myself, I couldn't afford to live in the city. I would have to sell my co-op and I don't wanna do that. I've lived here for 30 years. Um, what I see is so many giveaways to billionaire developers. Uh, for example, uh, Yankee Stadium cost 2.3 billion to build and the city funded 1.2 billion of that in taxpayer money in 2009. And the same year, City Field costs 830 million to build and 614 million in taxpayer money. Now let's take a look at our most recent development, which is a boondoggle, Hudson Yards, which taxpayers are on the hook for, for 5.6 billion with a B dollars, including $1 billion for special tax breaks for uh, commercial developers. $500 million for pocket parks, the most uh, expensive expenditure per acre in the city ever. You wanna get money for uh, tax revenue? Don't give these billionaires this kind of a uh, break. They are gonna build here anyway. Do you think George Steinbrenner was really gonna take the Yankees to New Jersey or elsewhere? Come on. Okay, you're balancing the, this on the backs of the middle class. Okay, I think you need to go back to the drawing board about how to really uh, get money to fund the city. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Michaela Grimm, followed by Eric Obenzinger. Time starts now. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I have lived in the city since 1994, and I have been a con condo owner since 1997. Uh, I've also submitted written testimony to you all. Um, I have been trying to correct a situation um, that's been occurring in our specific condo, but I know that's happened to others, and this seemed like the best time to do that. I've been actually trying to work on this situation for over 10 years, and hopefully in the new policy uh, that this is something that can be kind of corrected. Um, that you can basically uh, work on. Um, basically, since 2004, I've lived and owned our apartment at 3-7 Wooster Street. Our building has 11 units. Uh, we were the first unit to be purchased from the sponsor, and we were given an estimated uh, uh, tax bill um, from, the, uh, from the sponsor as part of our condo package, um, as they had not yet been decided from the Department of Finance because the certificate occupancy hadn't come till a year later. Uh, what had happened is that the market value of the sponsor units that are exactly like my unit, in fact, they're actually higher floors, three of them specifically, were given very uh, significantly lower market values basically than all the other units so that the actually property tax burden for our building has laid on everybody but the sponsors. I pay four times as much property tax as does the sponsor. Um, I have not been able to correct this because you need an unanimous decision by the building and those obviously that are take, taking this huge benefit are not in favor of changing this. So I basically ask you in the kind of element of fair and transparency and fairness that we can have a, a way that you can try to change the wrongs that are already done by the Department of Finance or the sponsor or whomever, um, because basically the financial property tax burden for our family is onerous. And it's very, very difficult every year for us to basically meet our property tax, uh, you know, situation. Um, and this was, uh, you know, a benefit given to sponsors uh, for no apparent reason. I don't Time know. Expired. And it was also inconsistent with the estimated tax bill that I received at our condo. Um, so it was, it came out of the blue, if you want to say, it was not what was part of my schedule A. And I've documentation to that point. So thank you so very much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now hear from Eric Obenzinger, followed by Lauren Runnels. Time starts now. 
Uh, thank you all for your time for this important policy dialogue. My name is Eric Obenzinger. I have spent most of my life in co-ops on the Upper West Side where my family has lived, worked, and voted continuously for over a century. I encourage you to see the assessed value growth cap as a blunt but important driver of fairness in line with the commission's goals to not induce displacement among long-term homeowners. <clears throat> Excuse me. After an adjustment period for new values, I suggest a blanket cap on tax appreciation for all co-ops, frankly, all housing, tied to inflation plus 2%. This cap is necessary for co-op stability and affordability. Two points to consider. One, as I'm sure you've heard many times before, co-ops provide wholesale housing. They don't make profits. Tax increases are passed along to shareholders and reduce co-op's capacity to spend on repairs and capital projects, which is increasingly critical as our housing stock ages and we need, have needs to comply with important green mandates. Two, above inflation tax increases are a silent killer for all housing. When my current building went co-op in 1980, my father joined the board. Real estate taxes were 12% of the building's operating costs. In 2019, I joined the same board where real estate taxes are 40% of its, oper of its uh, operating budget. So that's 12% to 40%. In real dollar terms, the tax burden has increased 10x faster than inflation. Our buildings face major expenses for facade work, heating, plumbing, energy efficiency upgrades, pandemic rent flexibility to commercial tenants. This is typical across the city. Without inflation limited cap, higher costs will be passed along to co-op owners simply because their neighbors choose to sell. And effectively, this forces a tax burden, a tax penalty on long-term co-op owners who, who see no cash benefit when their neighbors sell. Co-ops must legally apportion all taxes by share count, so I don't really see how a homestead exemption will help. Keep it simple, limit to inflation plus 2%. Just to wrap it up, co-ops provide wholesale housing to New Yorkers. The ultimate unfairness for anyone is above inflation tax burdens that push less Brian affluent expired. New Yorkers to jurisdictions with more stable taxes. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll now hear from Lauren Reynolds, followed by Gregory Carlson. Time starts now. So I just want to express my uh, gratitude to the commission and for their efforts in uh, trying to uh, create a more equitable system. Um, and I'm also grateful to have this opportunity to speak to you. I'm representing a 20 unit co-op in the East Village, we live on 13th Street. And so I wanted to offer our co-op's perspective. Since 2016, we've seen our property tax uh, rise by 20%, uh, roughly $25,000. And uh, and like Eric, who spoke previously, uh, a driver of our maintenance is property tax. Um, and so I don't quite understand all the commissioners uh, proposal and how it affects uh, co-ops. So one recommendation would be to uh, try to make um, your proposal a little bit more accessible so that uh, people who are not experts in finance can sort of apply it to uh, our situation and understand how it works. Um, in addition to that, in our co-op, we have a number of low income people and also people who are retiring soon. And sort of the, the, the increase in maintenance is uh, uh, making it quite a burden on them um, to, to live. Uh, so anything you can do to prevent uh, property tax going up from year to year, for us, it's been like five to 10% each year. That would be very helpful and appreciated. Um, I want to, that's all I have to say. So I just want to again thank you for your, uh, for having this hearing um, and I, I appreciate your efforts. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll now hear from Gregory Carlson, followed by Gregory Uden. Time starts now. Uh, yes, uh, I wanna thank the commission for doing its work, preliminary work and for holding hearings in each borough, even though we are all tuning in in Zoom. Uh, my name is Greg Carlson. I'm the executive director of the Federation of New York Housing Cooperatives and Condominiums. And I'm here in support of my sister organization, the Council of New York Co-ops, and my dear friend and colleague, Mary Ann Rothman. So I'm here to support her testimony. And we're on the same, uh, both organizations are on the same page. So I yield back the rest of my time. Thank you. 
Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll now hear from Gregor Yudan, followed by Ajit Thomas. Time starts now. Thank you. I am the research and advocacy coordinator at Dance NYC, a service organization serving dance, um, the dance sector in the Metro New York City area. The enduring cost of the pandemic is significant for both independent arts workers and organizations and is disproportionately impacting BIPOC, immigrant, and disabled arts communities. Dance NYC has been conducting comprehensive research on the impact of COVID-19 on the dance sector. 18% of dance organizations believe that permanent closure is extremely likely, and 84% of those facing um, permanent closure have budgets under 100,000. We have tracked at least 24 different organizations that have closed due to the pandemic. Most of these were primarily small businesses and beacons in their community. 83% of these have existed in New York City for over a decade and 43% have existed for more than 20 years. Property taxes remain a primary concern for nonprofits that own and manage property as well as landlords that lease to nonprofits. We are recommending tax exemption for nonprofit um, property owners and tax exempt, uh, incentives for landlords renting to nonprofit cultural organizations and businesses. This tax incentive could be made city specific with the creation of a voucher based tax break provided by the city um, for landlords. These policy changes would ensure the long term survival of cultural spaces, mitigating their displacement and in turn improving the real estate market in New York City, not just for artists and organizations, but for the communities that they serve. The arts and culture sector has long contended that nonprofits um, should universally receive the same benefits that are afforded to religious and educational institutions, exemption from real estate taxes. Nonprofits directly benefit the communities in which they are embedded, and extending property tax incentives to landlords that rent to nonprofits on minimum of three to five year leases at 30 to 40 percent below market value um, Time has expired. a benefit. Um, supporting the financial viability and sustainable longevity of tenant organizations that would otherwise risk losing their space and reducing the administrative and economic burden on for profit institutions at least to nonprofits. Um, thank you for your consideration and your time. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Ajit Thomas, followed by Ilan Rabinovich. Time starts now. Hi, I'm the president of a co-op in the Upper West Side. We have 85 apartments out of which 80, that's eight zero, are studios of one bedrooms. We have zero rental apartments. The fact that our building has zero small apartments with, uh, with no rentals tells you that our residents are neither wealthy nor are investors exploiting up market trends. However, our property taxes have risen 8% year over year since 2008 on an annual compounded basis. The Department of Finance, as it appraises value of co-ops, tries to come up with comparable rental buildings. It then determines that since the rental market is heating up, a building such as ours, in spite of having zero renters, must have its value and hence its taxes rise. This methodology to assess building value has zero connection with the type of residence or the physical property itself. In fact, even within co-ops, my friends who own three or $4 million apartments near me in three separate co-ops that are clearly wealthier than ours have only seen the property taxes increase one to 3% year over year for the last 12 years. Why the Department of Finance penalizes a middle-class building with smaller apartments is a mystery to us. Most people in our building are over 50 years old, several are retirees, and almost all are on fixed income that does not increase as much as our property taxes have. Department of Finance is actually forcing many of us to consider leaving the city due to the unjust tax regime that we cannot afford. So I implore you to reconsider the property tax methodology for co-ops such as ours, and also to revamp the current appeal process, which is run by lawyers, finance, and tax commission, which provides zero transparency to co-op or condo apartment owners. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now hear from Ilan Rabinovich, followed by Lois McCarthy. Time starts now. Um, yes, hello. Um, I will be submitting my testimony in writing. Uh, so if you can please give me the email address, that would be great. Thank you. 
Uh, Elan, you can uh, use the online uh, form that you use to register for this hearing to submit your testimony that way. Thank you. We will now hear from Lois McCarthy, followed by Justine Kuchia. Uh, Time starts now. Lois, uh, if you need to unmute. Now am I unmuted? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. So good evening. My name is Lois McCarthy, and I have a condo on the Upper West Side. We are writing to inform you of an unfair situation concerning condominiums, which has been going on for 20 years in our condo and continues to this day. While your report does not address this issue, we'll, we feel that the abuse is so unfair that it requires a resolution. Since 2007, all new condos and new conversions to condos have their individual units taxed based on their common interests. This became the rule based on a Memorandum on Condominium Property Tax Allocation to Individual Owners put forth by the Department of Finance. Um, before July 2007, sponsors, assessors, and other administrators could and did use other methods. In 2007, Department of Finance gave all pre-existing condos the opportunity to inform DOF if they chose to be taxed using their percentage of common interest. This would require the board of managers to submit an affidavit signed by all unit owners to reallocate their real estate taxes using this method. I am not aware that our board brought this opportunity to, to us to vote on because it only affected five unit owners and all others were benefiting from this misallocation. It was not until 2010 that I discovered this misallocation while talking with a neighbor in the building. She has a higher common interest than I, and we both were shocked to realize that her property taxes were literally half of mine. In fact, my tax allocation is 5.6977 from the DOF, and my common interest is 3.7. This caused me to pursue this situation vigor vigorously because it is so unfair. <clears throat> Time has expired. We estimate that this manipulated allocation has shifted approximately 2.75 million of the building's taxes onto the five units in question above our residential common interest over the 20 years we have been a condo. This is, is truly egregious. Also, there so 43 of the 48 units, we're paying part of their taxes, five of us, five units. Um, the 2007 rule change was required to stop abuses by sponsors, assessors, and other administrators. While DOF recognized this abuse and changed it in 2007 for condo conversions going forward, they in fact allow the abuse to, co to continue for earlier conversions. As noted above, earlier conversions can elect to use common interest on a tax allocation, but it requires 100% agreement from unit owners. This election was unrealistic and generally not feasible in those benefiting from their reduced tax allocations. We uh, were not likely to agree, but wait, we're not benefiting from their reduced tax allocations. Um, it is our position that the rule provided pre 2007 conversions was ineffective and extremely unfair. It effectively allows a recognized abuse to continue indefinitely. We ask that you provide a way to prevent this abuse from continuing. Thank you. Uh, Ms. McCarthy, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, when you say uh, common interest, do you mean uh, your percentage of the uh, cooperative ownership? It is a condo, it is my percentage of the condo and when we purchased our apartment we were told that everything goes by common interest um they 
in taxes, uh, my monthly, you know, uh, maintenance fee, my uh, comment, you know, all, everything goes by that when they, the assessments, everything. However, we were a new condo in uh, 20, you know, 20,000. Um, and uh, when we became a condo, the sponsor, somebody shifted literally 10% of the building's taxes onto the first five people who bought. And then the, and the others have skated, the other, all these other apartments, because they got their, their percentage of common interest for taxable taxes, residential taxes, lowered. And they shifted the, that onto us, um, onto five of us in the building. It's insane. And, um, um, okay, thank you. You've, you've answered my question. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you I, have, I have submitted this in written testimony. Thank you as well. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now hear from Justine Cuchilla, uh, followed by State Senator Robert Jackson. Time starts now. Thank you so much. My name is Justine Cuchilla, she, her pronouns, nouns, and I am a class two homeowner on unceded Lenape lands who is being forced out of my home and out of New York City by the unfairness built into the property tax system that this commission aims to reform. This is a complicated issue and two minutes is not nearly enough time to offer a cogent response to your work. So please refer to my written testimony for more depth. However, two minutes is all I got. So the first thing I'm asking you to do is to go back to the drawing board. Your proposals as set forth will do nothing to fix the inequities in the current system or create a simpler, cleaner, fairer property tax system. In your plan, middle and fixed income homeowners and seniors will continue to be forced from their homes, not by rent, but by taxes. And you've heard from other people tonight who've said the same thing. Second, don't touch or diminish in any way the protections currently enjoyed by class one homeowners. You do not cure unfairness by spreading it around more widely. You cure unfairness by stopping it. And reforming New York's property tax system will not work if your goal is to make more people suffer more equally. The goal must be to reduce the suffering for everybody. Third, extend all class two homeowners and homeowner occupied dwellings the same protections that class one homeowners now receive. To achieve these goals, this commission must reject the scam that is revenue neutral tax reform. Yes, this is gonna take political courage on your parts. Yes, this will cost the city a lot of money, which will have to be found elsewhere. And this is because it should. The city has no business punishing or penalizing anybody for working hard and saving money to buy a home, regardless of what class that home falls into. Owner occupied class two homeowners have home ownership has gone from being the local version of the American dream to a dysfunctional New York City nightmare. And in order for our nightmare to stop, decision makers like you will have to wake up. And if you don't, if you continue to force middle-class homeowners to abandon New York, you're gonna destroy communities and neighborhoods while returning our city to municipal meltdown and the civic apocalypse of the mid 1970s. Time has expired. You've been given the opportunity to prevent this. I really ask you all to use it. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we will now hear from State Senator Robert Jackson, followed by I Joseph. Yield, yeah. Time starts now. I yield my time. I want to listen more so than talk. Okay, thank you, State Senator. Um, we'll then hear from Joseph Medea, followed by Suzanne Sobel. Time starts now. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Thank you for uh, allowing me to testify. I submitted this. The importance of the property tax system is obvious. However, any changes ponder to the system of taxation must carefully and thoroughly consider the impact on all those who bear the responsibility of paying for it. My review of the commissioner's preliminary report indicates that they have not considered the pain and burden their recommendations will cause on those who pay property taxes. For example, recommendation three, assessing every property in the residential class at full market value, this is a non-starter because it will cause every, a very large step change in property taxes and will overwhelm the taxpaying middle class. Such residents will flee our cities for the nearby suburbs as it will be no longer financially conducive to live in the city. Recommendation number four, also a non-starter because it seeks to eliminate 
assessment value growth caps, such growth caps, which have been an advantage for taxpaying homeowners and protected them from step changes in the tax. Recommendation number five is faulty because the partial homestead exemption for primary residence is for those with income below a certain threshold. This recommendation does not define what the threshold is, thus subjecting it to favoritism and inequity. The recommendation must be open to all homeowners regardless of any income threshold. Commissioner's recommendation number six to create a circuit breaker to lower the tax burden on low-income property residents should be extended to all primary residents to protect all tax-paying property owners. Recommendation number nine indicates a gradual transition to a new system for current owners. How long does this transit gradual system is? Is ill-defined. Some owners may need more time than others due to the gap between their market value and effective market value. Your, your report offers no real improvement for what was described in the 1970s tax reform and its aftermath. It adopts a path that will result in an immediate upending of our current assessment practice and reassessment of all pri properties at full market value, causing fiscal havoc to our residential homeowners. Above and beyond the recommendations, the commissioners, you must go after extremely large property owners such as Columbia University and NYU and Madison Square Garden and many others like them will pay no property taxes. Time this expired. Millions. In sum, whatever methodology is contemplated, it must be tax neutral. We cannot tolerate step changes in taxation, which are unfair, inequitable, chaotic, haphazard, and capricious. The capping of growth of assessed values with market conditions, the equalization changes of no more than 6% and 20% cumulative must remain in place. This is the circuit breaker that protects us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for your testimony. We'll now hear from Suzanne Sobel, followed by Louis Rogers Roman. Time starts now. My name is Suzanne Sobel. I reside in Manhattan and own an apartment in a co-op building, and I object to this proposed change in the tax assessment calculations using current market value of co-op condo buildings. The proposed change affects senior citizens and retirees in a negative and harmful way. Senior citizens and retirees are often on fixed incomes. They made certain financial assumptions that will be upended by the proposed revision of the tax assessments, notably affecting their largest and most secure asset, their home. Simplicity and consistency are not appropriate goals where they will result in harm to senior citizens and retirees. I urge you to consider seniors and not to make these changes. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we'll now hear from Lewis Rogers Roman, followed by Tal Shub. Time starts now. Hi, um, this is Louise Rogers Roman. It's Louise, not Lewis. And I am a retired person. I cannot afford a 20% increase on my rent on an annual basis. And I had written to Rebecca Seawright about this recently. And she, this was in March, and she had said that she was definitely going to. Um, you know, rebut this particular tax. So I don't have a whole lot more to say, but I am, again, a retired person, and this is absolutely out of the question. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We will now hear from Tal Shub. Um, Time starts now. Hi, my name is Tal Shub. Um, I'm here to represent 65 Nassau Street in Manhattan. We're a co-op and financial district consisting of uh, just under 30 units. Our co-op is home to hardworking families. Many of us are immigrants. The majority of us send our kids to public schools. Many of us have stuck through some of the toughest times in New York history, including 9-11, which was around the corner from our building, and obviously the past year with COVID-19. It's a perfectly nice building, but it's far from being a luxury resident. And every year our taxes go up dramatically disproportionate to the actual appreciation of property value, inflation, or our income. So it's clear that the current methodology of calculate, calculating the value of co-ops based on some made up potential income from rent is ridiculous and counterintuitive. 
as many have pointed out, fundamentally co-ops are created and structured to this day for people to own property that they personally live in. These are not investments. We're not generating any income from it. So um, conceptually, it seems that the commission's recommendations pertaining to calculating taxes based on sale prices are a step in the right direction. However, it is unclear from the preliminary report what would be the direct implications for a building like ours when we get to the actual math? Would our already incredibly high property taxes go up or down? It's absolutely critical that we put a reasonable cap on the rate of year over year tax increase for co-ops. It is also vital that we ensure proper transparency of the assessment process. I also recognize that so much of this comes to the nuts and bolts of the, the implementation. So I do welcome the effort of this commission to correct the, the broken system. And I hope that it results in a more fair distribution of the tax responsibility, as many have pointed out. We know that the, the billionaires and the huge rentals um, are not equally responsible. At the same time, you know, I'm, I'm equally concerned that major changes like this, unfortunately, often marginalize smaller groups of the population, the decision-making process. In this case, it could be co-op owners in Manhattan. So I hope that um, your finding and decisions will translate to a reform that will benefit more New Yorkers um, and our city in the long run. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. This now concludes the public testimony. If we have inadvertently forgotten to call on someone to testify, if that person could raise their hand using the resume raise hand function, we'll try to hear from you now. Chair Shaw, it appears that no other members of the public would like to testify. I guess everybody wants to watch the debate it starts in a couple of minutes. Um, so thank you, Amra. Um, this concludes the last of the five borough-based public hearings to solicit feedback on the commission's 10 recommendations to reform New York City's property tax system. I'd like to thank all the members of the public and elected officials who joined us tonight and over the past several weeks to give feedback on the commission's preliminary report. Your comments are important as the commission develops its final recommendations. For members of the public who are listening and would like to submit written testimony, please do so as soon as you can. To submit written testimony, please visit the commission's website at nyc.gov slash property tax reform. Finally, I'd like to thank the members of the commission for their time tonight, and especially the staffs of the city council and the mayor's office for making this hearing possible. Thank you and good evening, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye all. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Thank you so much. Good night, night everybody. Thank you. Thank you.